Tech Team Weekly. This show may contain mature language and themes. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Tech Team Weekly. I am your testing representative, Neil Studd, and I'm joined, as always, by Sand. Hi, Sand. Hello, Neil. Hello, everyone. And hello to you, Sand, and hello to Gwen. How are you doing, Gwen? Hey, yeah, uh, I'm all right. I'm uh, I'm excited for the episode. It's uh, it's a nice breakup for the week. So, yeah. yeah. Are yeah. you good? I think I'm not bad. It's been quite a week for all of us. We're in the latest round of panic buying here in the UK. Hope you've all got all the petrol you need. <laughs> Honestly, it's ridiculous. Yeah, what it's a ridiculous. What a faff. What a what a bloody kerfuffle. And yeah, the media it, just doesn't help, does it? No. It's the same as toilet paper gate all over again. It's, yeah, this circle of the media says there's a shortage, but there isn't. And then people read the media and then create a shortage. And then the media reports on the actual shortage. Uh, so uh, I'm fortunate in that I work from home. And the longest drive I have to do is a two mile drive to nursery three times a week. But my wife is already looking at her tank and going, well, I work 30 miles away. <laughs> I drive 30 miles a day. How many oh, days have I got left before I can't get to work anymore? Oh, no. Oh, God. But hopefully we'll provide an escape from that for you uh, on this podcast here today. As usual, we've got all our user sections. We'll talk through the stand up section where we'll all tell you how stressy our weeks have been. We'll get into our main topic for the day, which is we're going to talk about um, disclosing salaries in public, whether it's a good idea and, and whether it can help drive salary equality. Equality? The word equality. Equality. <laughs> Well, just, just say, equality is today. a beautiful That's, yeah. it's a gorgeous word the, the, the sense <laughs> yeah. of being equal yes uh, and then we'll have our usual news bites which have all sorts of things to do with accessibility security and privacy and uh, then we'll be out of here i guess let's see if we can do it on time and on schedule let's do it let's go stand up the stand up I feel like I don't have the woes that you two do. So let me start off a little lighthearted and then, and then we can get into it. Yeah, this week, uh, my job update, uh, it's kind of in, in the works. I can't say anything yet. Hopefully next week I can, I can say something, uh, some interesting conversations going on. Lots of really uh, fantastic opportunities. I'm really grateful for all the people that I know in the industry. Diablo 2 came out or Diablo 2 remastered or, or whatever. I've got it and I haven't even played it yet. Um, I've been, I've been really busy this week, uh, partly like meeting up with people going out and about, um, and working on the PDD page. So our podcast driven, uh, development page on our website, which tracks all of our analytics and that we talk about here as well. We wanted to automate it. So Neil didn't have to update it, you know, every day and, and maintain the page. So, um, I'll tell you more about that later. Um, and, uh, so I had a little, uh, outing, I had a little field trip, uh, this week, I, I went to a company called Bionic uh, in uh, in uh, London, um, and uh, the CTO and the MD there are uh, Neil and I's former CTO and MD from uh, Compare the Market. Uh, uh, Paul Galligan is the uh, MD, and James Lomas, or JLo as we know him, uh, is is the CTO there. I love JLo. You know, he's he's an awesome guy. Like he's he's been a great friend to me, and you know, I'm a big fan of his. And so he invited me down there for their town hall. It was a really nice experience, and I haven't been to a town hall in ages. I haven't even been in that kind of environment for ages. So it was really great to see their office and meet with everyone. They were really nice to me, and they even let me present in their town hall. So I did a slide plugging Tech Team Weekly, and I told them all to check it out. So hopefully the Bionic gang are here with us today. Um, and yeah, they're, they're a great bunch. You know, we went to the pub afterwards and we had a, we had a great laugh. The funny thing is in the town hall, I called them JLo. I said, yeah, so, you know, me and JLo go, go way back, you know, and everyone laughed and then it clicked. I was like, oh, maybe they don't call them JLo, <laughs> 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 but I, I, I guess they do now. <laughs> I can only imagine how disappointed Gwen is that the segment of our script that says JLo story turned out to not be about uh, Jennifer Lopez at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's... I'm happy with the nickname JLo. That's that's a beautiful nickname. <laughs> he's he's even more beautiful than the real JLo. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's my week. Over to you, Gwenny. So it has. Uh, oh, so uh, before I go into my week, so Diablo two. Uh, my partner Ash and I used to play Diablo 2 all the time, um, but I used to fall asleep every single time and I could never find, figure out why I used to fall asleep all the time. And it ends up, it's because I was bored. I was fucking bored shitless. <laughs> and it took me ages to realise why I was falling asleep while playing it. But because 
it's just button mashing and you always mm. win pretty much don't you you never mm. die and so yeah like it's quite fun collecting everything but apparently it's just not what i'm into so yeah fair um, enough that's my funny diablo story. <laughs> um so this week has just been like mega intense so uh we're launching rocks at work which are kind of like okrs um but it's a framework that is new to me this whole rocks kind of stuff it's from eos worldwide so i've got a book called traction that i need to read and all that kind of stuff um it's all very kind of like i am a business person kind of stuff which is bizarre to me um but yeah so uh usually i like to like stick my nose in the product and do a little bit of testing um and stuff like that but i haven't been able to do like pretty much any this week and I don't think I'm going to be able to do testing again for a while because I've just got so much documentation and strategy and stuff to do now. So, um, and so much that I didn't get like to do the like documentation and strategy that I planned to do at the start of the week. I don't know when I'm going to do it now. So yeah, it's been all thrown up in the air. Um, we also had an incident at work last week, which like, it's really, really rare for us to have an incident. It, uh, we, I've worked there for like over a year and a half and we've never had an incident like this, like uh -huh. where we've all had to like organize ourselves and do stuff. So we didn't have a process written up for it. Um, but I've worked places where we have like massive incidents before. So I just challenged like what to do in an incident um, and like ran war rooms and all that kind of stuff like that. But then um, afterwards we had a retro to figure out what we can improve. So I wrote that process up. So we're going to have an incident process now, which is bizarre. Awesome. But yeah. Yeah. It's quite interesting. Um, yeah. Like Monzo was really, really good at incidents and I did a bit of incident management there. Um, and as well, I was pondering whether I should talk about this on news bites, but, um, if you, anyone's read about like the Monzo incident management process, they've, there's been a little group that spun has spun out and created a company called incident io on how to manage your incidents um so yeah if you have incidents at work check those like well guys out because yeah it's pretty cool anyway sorry total distraction so um the next thing is uh i'm moving squads so my squads my old squad has gone down the one where i used to do a little bit of testing on um and i'm going to become a scrum master now um for another squad squad so i've been writing like training for the team and uh i'm gonna be kicking off sprints so i'm like ah, i wouldn't have chosen scrum i've been doing scrum since like 2012. i'm gonna board a scrum but like we'll see how it goes um at least it's something i know i guess so yeah um so yeah work's just been absolutely insane outside of work <laughs> though i hosted a ministry of testing masterclass which i haven't done in ages um and it was just so awesome so there was a dude called thomas shipley on who i hadn't met before and he was talking about test strategy and it was just like totally awesome i love hosting webinars because i get to meet <laughs> <new> humans <laughs> bless you neil <laughs> sorry <Wow. laughs> didn't reach the mute button in time <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah next week uh just loads of stuff around sprints and a holiday to aaron i feel like that was really long sorry that's Lots okay incidents incidents are terrible no one wants them but they're so much fun right that was really interesting. So, um, because a lot of our developers are from, um, one place and they used to have incidents all the time. And so when I started the war rooms, like their eyes lit up, they were like, mm. yes, yes. Like incidents. It's, and I'm like, yeah. you're a little bit too excited <laughs> about this, <laughs> but like, yeah, people do love a good incident. Don't it's, they? it's such a buzz. You get such a rush, you know? Mm hmm. Totally. Totally. I, yeah. I, I, but it was. I, I'll bet Stutter has been in a few incidents in his time. I have. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're all better in hindsight, aren't they? I mean, when, when you're right in the middle of it, perhaps not quite so exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like no. I should be bringing a Diablo 2 story as well, which I sadly don't really have. Um, my, my only real exposure to the franchise was actually Diablo 3 when it came out. There was a Tesco club car promotion mm. where if you bought a copy of the game, which was like £30, basically you got £40 worth of club card vouchers. So I literally bought 10 copies of the game, sold them all on eBay and pocketed, you know, Whoa, wow. back of it. that's, that's as close as I got to the franchise, <laughs> <Bizarre>. but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
But That's amazing. It, yeah. But in terms of how my week has gone, well, I finally did the event I've been talking about since episode one, which was uh, my Postman Space Camp webinar, which is kind of an advanced guide to how to use Postman for testing, which was uh, broadcast live and is now available on catch up on YouTube. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Um, but the only downside was there just wasn't enough time to cover all the material. So it was very, very fast. Um, we said that we had a retro after and said that the only thing we'd do if we did it again, we wouldn't cut any material out. We would have made the session a bit longer, but uh, it's there on YouTube for anyone to play back at like 0.5 speed. I would recommend that. <laughs> um, it's been a busy week elsewhere at Postman. We've done a soft launch for a new feature called the Flow Runner, which we've been working on for ages. Basically, um, it's an advanced way that you can, it's like a, a, a widget based um canvas where you can drag and drop components and stitch them together um previously if you wanted to start chaining requests together in postman or start carrying values between requests um you had to know a fair amount of javascript and how to structure it and write good code um this is basically our codeless approach to chaining processes together if you ever used a service like uh, yahoo pipes i was really into back in the day before it got shut down because it wasn't making yahoo any money um like it really, really opens up Postman um, to a whole new audience. Um, we're, we're very excited on building that. It's in beta right now. Uh, we haven't really pushed it yet, but um, check it out if you get a chance. Uh, all this means is it's been another very tough week for the testers at Postman. Um, there's a lot of um, different release branches ongoing. We're spending a lot of time just on test stabilization because like massive reams of new code appears from five different teams at once. And we have to massage the automation back into a working state again. But um, it's very much the grind, uh, but it's it's what we're employed for. So uh, we're, we're pushing on. Um, outside of Postman, Gwen, I'm surprised you didn't uh, give a name check to the upcoming test.bash conference from the Ministry of Testing, which you are joint comparing. Nice. I'm so excited. I love test bash. Like it's my favorite. The like the one in Manchester is totally amazing, but the online one's always really good as well. And they're always doing new things for it with Ministry of Testing. They're amazing. Yeah, I'm a long time attendee of both the in-person and the online talks. And actually, I am giving a talk at Test.Bash upcoming. Yay! Um, Gwen, Gwen is not my compare. Uh, Vernon is going to be hosting my session um, on uh, it's a one-day conference on the 28th of October. Uh, it's free if you're a Ministry of Testing Pro subscriber. Otherwise, it's just £75 for a day ticket. Um, their events are always amazing. There's like I think there's 15 or 19 talks, something. It's it's crazy. Um, check it out on their site uh, if you get a chance. Um, this is going long, isn't it? Um, I've got loads of what to say. I could go on about my Peloton, which is still driving it's me very long. Uh, crazy in a good way. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm doing my 100th Peloton ride on Tuesday morning. Uh, I'm getting up especially early to do a 6.30 hey. session with my favourite instructor. Um, yeah, uh, re really enjoying Oof. that. It's also finally the week that the new Bond movie comes out. That's Wednesday night. I'm going to a midnight screening of that and then working on Thursday. So that's going to be interesting. And as if to round off what's already been a very, very weird week, um, there was a, a general election on the Isle of Man this week. And my father-in-law has been elected to Parliament on the Isle of Man, which is highly unexpected. Wow. Yeah, he is a um, he's <laughs> wow. he's a quite a well-known figure in the community. He was a, a, a disc jockey, disc jockey DJ. People just call them DJs on Manx Radio for a long time. He is kind of a uh, I'm going to put it politely. He's kind of like a Jeremy Vine figure in that he's a. Uh, he does try to stir stir the pot quite a lot. He's got in trouble in the past. Um, he, on one hand, people say they like that he's a straight talker. On the other hand, people say, yeah, some of the stuff he says is a bit, I'm not going to say Trumpian, but mm. he leans that way occasionally. Mm. Um, but but mm -hmm. it's an achievement. So um, it's, it's kept our family very busy. <laughs> um, and uh, here we are. <laughs> That's awesome. Does that mean you've been to the Isle of Man, Neil? I've only been myself um, just just the one time uh, before lockdowns and before the baby yeah. arrived. Um, but yeah, I've been over there. It's a it's a lovely island. It, it does very much have its own identity. Uh, yeah, it, it tries to like I say it yeah. has its own lo local parliament full of local representatives that control the island. They they were the very first people during the first lockdown to fully literally close their borders. Like they shut the ports, they shut the airport, and they just they got the, they got COVID under control, um, which is great. Sensible people. Yes, totally. Where, where do where we you? find a few of those? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should go to the Isle of Man and yeah. find them there. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Social engineering. Yes, Social please. engineering. <laughs> Social engineering. So Oh, that is perfect. <laughs> I thought it was a computer voice, but it turns out it was Sam J. Lolo. <laughs> it's just me. <laughs> 
So uh, we had some brilliant feedback and comments from social media this week. So um, from our last episode of YouTube, we had Kevlar. Oh, uh, I assume it's Kevlar. This is my uh, best friend. 76. Yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah, oh, yeah, this Kev. is Kev. This is Kev, who oh. does all our uh, art for us. Amazing. So uh, Kev says, another great episode. Not quite my industry, which makes sense, seeing as he does our art, but just love listening slash watching to you guys. Great topic about passwords, the bane of my life. Not only do I need to keep tabs on my own, but I need to manage my parents as well. Mm. That sounds pretty brutal. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, that's an improvement um, on them all so having their the... passwords set as password, which I'm sure most people's parents are doing. So I think, Kev, you're, you're doing wonders. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Password one. Um, <laughs> excellent. Uh, so the next comment is from Lee Rathbone, uh, where he says, great episode. Hope you're feeling better, Lee. So Lee's been talking about how he hasn't been feeling very well on social media and stuff like that. So yeah, Lee, hope you're feeling loads better. Yeah, um, get well, mate. Yeah, yeah, I think it's half um, half COVID, half being an Aston Villa supporter. It's always uh, always tough. <laughs> <laughs> sick burn, sick burn. Now. Get a guy once down. Brutal. <laughs> Um, and the next one is from Emily Wood Malloway, who I work with. So thanks for listening, Emily. Uh, so this is awesome. Thank you. We're trying to put all of our processes into Confluence, and I'm definitely going to add a how I like to mm. be communicated with section mm. for all of our team members. I think that was your suggestion, wasn't it, Neil? Yeah, I actually, funnily enough, the day before we recorded that episode, I had uh, my first proper career management session with my new line manager. And I completely forgot that I'd written that document down. And he was asking loads of questions like, how do you like to be communicated with? And I was telling him. And then we recorded this episode and I had to go back to him and say, oh, shit, by the way, there's this document you can look at. I wrote it for this purpose. <laughs> Next one is from Twitter. Uh, so from Lee Hawkins, who is the rocker tester, who um, I have to meet one day. He just seems really rad. So thanks for another entertaining and informative podcast. One way to reduce the noise from collaboration tools is to move to Teams. It's awful and unintuitive design <laughs> provides a natural <laughs> barrier to UC. Um, so wow. I've only, <laughs> that's, uh, that's harsh. I, I mean, dig it. So it's effective. <laughs> I've only tried to use it once. Um, I tried to use it at Sky. We were getting like the senior leadership team to use it and i was just like i can't find anything this is just stressful it's just something on top of sharepoint <laughs> and i do not want that like <laughs> yeah have you used it neil yeah it was in use at money supermarket and i think in defense of teams it was a late entry into the market and it very much is yeah it's a reskin reskinned sharepoint turned into a, a, a IM platform basically, but in their defense, they had to move very quickly during the pandemic um, because uh, the Microsoft suite is obviously heavily used in schools and the school sector was driving a lot of their new features that, that were requested because there's so much stuff that you can get away with not implementing in the workplace. Like um, we say, like, even Slack doesn't have the option to mute someone who's in your network because you're like, well, you're a business, you can all that maturely and whatever. But when you've got a hundred kids and mm -hmm. you're trying to teach them, no, you need to be able to mute someone. Then suddenly <laughs> a feature that was like, we're never going to do that becomes, we need to do this or we're going to lose loads of market share. Yeah. I, I looked into being able to block someone on Slack quite oh, a couple of years ago. Um, and you can't because it's business stuff, but it's also used for community stuff. And sometimes you're like, I want to block this person because they keep harassing me. Mm, and the best yeah. you can do is mute. So you don't see their DMs, but yeah, like community wise, I don't know. I guess you just need people to be able to deal with it. Like admins to be able to deal with people harassing you and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll bet there must be a plugin for that or something, no, or a definitely gap in the market for Slack to implement. Yeah, I've not seen, I've not looked at it for quite a while. It might have changed. Um, but yeah, definitely like two years ago, you couldn't do anything besides mute their private messages. So okay. yeah. In podcast driven development, then uh, a quick look at our figures. So uh, on LinkedIn, where uh, uh, our LinkedIn followers are up 5% from last week, our, our Patreon uh, is up 33% from last week. We, we got a new Patreon uh, uh, patron. Thank you very much to Daily Pie. I think this is someone else that uh, we yeah, know. This is uh, James Espy, an another person from the test community. Uh, we're going to have to rename, rename this podcast Test Team Weekly at this rate, Sanj. I know, at this rate, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how happy I'd be with that. <laughs> <laughs>
but uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so yeah, that's... thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. Um, on on Twitter, we're up four uh, percent uh, followers. Uh, YouTube's doing pretty good, uh, or up seven percent in terms of subscribers, up twenty six percent in terms of views from last week. So I think that's kicking in. The algorithm is maybe starting to pick us up. Anchor is doing very very well, up forty six percent listens from from last week. Um, yeah, we changed our strategy this week so that when we share the episode mm. on Twitter, rather rather than putting the link straight to YouTube, um, as someone suggested the other week, we're like, well, actually, if we link to our episode page on our website, that then lets you choose whether you're going to have the audio or the video version. And that does seem to have allowed more people to find uh, our podcast feed on the typical podcast apps. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And thanks to the little charts that we have now, we can see the sort of the trend lines and it really brings the data to life. And you can see Anchor is really trending upwards right now. And yeah, if, if you want to go check that out, you can go to our website, techteamweekly.com. And in the menu, there's a link to PDD, which is podcast driven development. And you can see our uh, analytics uh, as they flow in. And uh, we've, so we've automated it this week. Um, it's just like a simple uh, app that uh, goes, fetches all the data and it writes it to a, a Google spreadsheet of all things, because it's very hipster. And it's very kind of the cool thing now to use spreadsheets as databases, you know, um, but I decided I wasn't cool enough to use Notion or Airtable, so I just stuck with like Google Sheets. Um, and then, yeah, that's, that sounds sensible. Works. Yeah, are you going to open source it? I'm happy to make it public. I don't think it's good enough yeah. to be open. It's very simple. It's very lightweight code. There's not much to it. But if, if anyone's curious or wants to know um, how we do it, then uh, let me know. I'm, I'll be happy to to open it up. Sam. This week's epic. Okay, so public salaries. Uh, this was uh, this was an article uh, by Jane, Jamie Tanner, I believe uh, is his name, um, and he wrote this article about uh, uh, the need for uh, transparency, transparency and equality when it comes to sort of uh, salaries, um, which is really a great point. Now I'm going to quote some of his article here. It's it's very important to know if you're being correctly compensated compared to your colleagues, so you can demand the compensation you're o you're owed. Uh, finding out that someone sitting next to you earns double for the same work is incredibly demoralizing. Yeah, it sure is. Minorities are generally less likely to ask for increments and are more likely to be discriminated against. So as a friend of mine uh, once put it, this, uh, once put it, channel your inner middle-aged white man who'd feel entitled to ask for more. It's incredibly likely that there are colleagues who'd be demanding compensation increases just because they want them. So you shouldn't be feeling like you shouldn't either. And uh, he, he discusses his salary from uh, being an intern back in 2014 to being a tech lead right now. You know, uh, we're, we're going to link the article. You can go check it out um, if you want. Uh, it's it's really great that he's doing that. I know a lot of people just kind of make initiatives like, like this, and there are, you know, public salary databases here and there that people can contribute to as well. Um, now, I know employers kind of tend to maybe discourage it a little, um, but technically it, it's illegal for them to do that. It's in the UK and in the US, it's completely legal to discuss your pay if you choose to. And in the UK, this is thanks to the Equality Act of 2010, um, which legally protects people from discrimination in the workplace and in wider society. So we can see the motives around all this stuff, right? Like the the reason is because there's pay discrimination, there's inequity, and this is one way of addressing that, right? Um, there are ways that we can find out salaries for specific roles. You know, uh, obviously many people will post their salaries, particularly in tech online, because you're much less likely to get a response if you don't post a salary. Um, there's, there's sites like uh, Glassdoor as well, which is very popular. You can go see salary ranges at various companies. And there's a site which called Blind. Uh, it's at teamblind.com, which have either of you heard of this before? No. Because it came up in one of our articles in... Um, I think one of the episode one when we talk about the Great Resignation, I think someone had written about how they were getting the the hell out of tech, uh, and oh, they really? posted that on Blind. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, this is a fantastic site, a really interesting one that I feel like not many people know about, and probably should, especially if you work in tech. So this is like a kind of like if you're in the elite of the elite, you know. Here, people are posting salaries. If you're in like the 200k a year range, 300k a year range, you know, it's for like basically the top top roles that like you know the, the fangs of this world, you know. Um, but it's it's an anonymous professional network, so it's completely anonymous. People can share information, and there's like little forums, and there's really in, uh, interesting talk about you know how to uh, how to handle the interview process or how to like um, 
negotiate for more and to find out, you know, what people are making. So if you want to have a look at uh, uh, a peek into the lifestyle of, of the rich and famous in our industry, go go check out blind.com. Or well, certainly those who claim to be rich and famous. I think yeah. with anonymity comes, that comes a pinch of salt with some of those, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But there are definitely people at that end, you know, um, and I yeah. think a lot of the conversation there sounds pretty authentic anyway. So there's there's lots of pros and cons here. You know, do we, should we be discussing, should we be discussing our salaries openly? Should it just be public? Um, what, what are the pros and cons here? Uh, which one of you would like to jump in first? A lot of companies doing the progression framework thing isn't there so that pay is a lot more public um so some some of the teams when i was at monzo particularly the data team they um they made it so you could see what level everyone was at so you could like agreed with the people that were in the team first but like so you could see whether someone was like a 2d or a 3a or whatever just so you had like a general idea of where they were um and I think I think that's quite cool. Um, yeah, and I think it is important for people to know that they are getting paid fairly much the same wage. There's a real there's a real problem that the people that are more confident or loud spoken will ask for more money mm -hmm. when they go for job interviews, and a lot of the time they will get more money because they have asked for it, and that needs to stop i think um because it does disadvantage uh like the people that aren't like confident mm. perhaps white men a lot of the time um mm. yeah like the thing think like a think like a uh middle-aged like white, white man. man yeah 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 i think that's great advice mm -hmm. totally i think there certainly is a a taboo around some of this stuff i think the, the goal certainly is is pay equality I've said the word wrong again. I mean, we, thanks for what we're talking about. Why can't I say the word equality today? <laughs> we so, just, so that's, let's that's... just make it equality. <laughs> God, it's lucky I'm not like a, a qualified like English student <laughs> slash journalist. Um, so that's 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 the goal, and and I, I think if if I've said this in previous episodes, if we lived in a world where everyone was was honest, um, you wouldn't necessarily need salary transparency to do that. You could just pay everyone the same. Um, however, I think this showing showing salaries in public is an acknowledgement that people aren't doing that. I think the resistance from some companies to to actually doing this is because it will drag everyone up to the the levels of your highest performance because your highest performance aren't going to take a pay cut to come down to everyone else's level. So it could mm -hmm. be an expensive process for them to to achieve equality. Um, you mentioned the, the legal um, imperative, Sanj. I think it's really interesting. There was a story we nearly discussed last week about Apple, where internally employees have been starting to try and gather data to, mm. to, to publicize, you know, let's share with each other how much we're getting paid. Let's try and drive yeah. this equality ourselves. Um, those surveys internally keep getting shut down by Apple and they keep finding tenuous reasons to do it, like technicalities, like the first time they tried to run one of these mm. employee um, surveys internally, they said, oh no, you're capturing gender data. That's protected information. We won't allow you to capture that. So they relaunched it without the gender question. And then the company got the backs up because it was stored on the wrong kind of uh, like Dropbox type thing that the company didn't support. And um, there's there's definitely some uh, rumblings inside Apple that where mm. they're trying to get this work in and they're not cracking it. Uh, and I think Jamie himself references uh, that this incident uh, at Apple himself uh, as well. Um, it's but I mean, you know, shutting it down for gender reasons. I mean, gender is one of the largest factors to in inequity in pay if I'm not mistaken, right? Completely. Um, yeah, except if you're in countries like Iceland or is Norway pretty good at it as well? I, I think so, um, the, the Scandinavian countries, yeah. Yeah, and they worked hard at it, like, what, in the 60s to make it, like, less of a problem. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's a total shame. And I feel like you have to, like, push a lot harder as a woman to be like, mm. I want this amount of money. And you're taught not to ask for like high amounts of money as a woman. And it's something that I make sure to encourage people that I manage, like, you mm. know, mm. you have to ask for a certain amount of money um, and know your worth. Um, yeah, it's really important. And so, so you can teach them for the future as well. 
like when they're applying for different jobs. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the confidence plays a big part in this, right? Confidence in getting mm -hmm. that promotion, getting that new role, you know, fighting for that raise, right? And, mm -hmm. and you know, maybe like your line manager should, should step in there, you know, uh, a little bit, um, help out. That, that, that's maybe a responsibility there. Totally, totally. Like letting people know their worth. So it depends mm. on where it is as well. Like a lot of the time the line manager will be writing the proposals for it and stuff like that as well. I love writing pay rise proposals for people and being <laughs> like, I believe this is the reason why they should do it. This is the information I've collected and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, it's amazing. I didn't get to do that this year because we didn't do it in a proposal format, but I'm, I hope that we get to next year. I, I don't know if it's something that I should enjoy uh, and I don't know if other <laughs> managers enjoy it, but it's just so nice to be able to be like, this is my person that I'm like promoting and this is why they're worth this much. Um, they're amazing. Like we mm. should totally be giving this and then fighting for that. I don't know. I just yeah. think it's fun. <laughs> I've done a couple of those like salary review board type things before where, yeah, I've acted as the advocate for someone who's in my team and said, um, this is why this person deserves a raise. But um, in some ways, it's kind of it's a shame that you need something that formal rather than just having kind of an across the board, um, you know, re review process and saying, actually, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I know it's going to cost you cost you money as a company, but, you know, um, there is things like inflation to consider as well at the, at the very least, where, you know, if you're not giving your people raises, you're technically mm -hmm. giving them pay cuts. Um, I, Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting, Sandy, you, men you mentioned in the questioning at the beginning um, that it, it might be demoralised to find out that someone who sits next to you is earning double what you earn. Um, as a veteran, mm -hmm. flipping that around, how would you think you might feel? Uh, uh, how do I think I might feel? Uh, not to call you a veteran. <laughs> you know, if you're the person who earns mm -hmm. twice as much, how do you think you might feel finding out yeah. the person next to you earns half as much? Is that, yeah. is that a concern? I, I think... Yeah, absolutely. It's a concern for me, you know, I mean, this is going to be my next question to the two of you, you know, would, would either of you hypothetically consider making your salary history public, you know, like, personally, I would, I don't know, like, I don't want, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure how I'd feel about it. You know, I wouldn't want anyone to feel bad, you know, and, and I feel like it contributes as well to like a pecking order, you know, in a company, we already have these lines between like, you know, roles, right, job titles. And if you find out you're making like so much more than someone else or vice versa, I feel like it really impact you, you know? So because I, because I sort out the salaries and do all of that, I know what other people are earning and the people that earn more money than me, I'm just like, yeah, too right. They do like, I know what they do and like, yeah, to know they're not doing the same job as me. Um, mm. like, and they've been there longer, they have different skills to me and it's okay. And the people that are doing similar stuff are the paid, paid like the same as me. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, well, that's good. There, there's a good good balance there. But Gwenny, would mm -hmm. you, how would you feel about making your salary history public? Well, I should do it being a woman in tech, really. I mean, Jamie's mm. probably right. I should be doing this and being like, and this is how I made this jump um, mm. as well. So people, people know. So, yeah. So when I was made a test manager, I was accidentally, I accidentally became a test manager. Um, and uh, my head of development pulled me aside and he was like, you know, uh, this dude is no longer going to manage the testers. Uh, you're going to manage them all. And I said to him, well, you better fucking pay me more for that. Mm. <laughs> and he was like really taken aback. And I'm like, I'm not doing that for free, mate. Like mm. you mm. need to pay me more. <laughs> like I didn't come here to manage people. I came here as a senior tester. Um, and you're just telling me I'm now the test manager, like give me more money. And yeah, I don't know. It takes a lot of, it takes being quite, uh, like forward to do that. Mm. But, yeah, but to. if I didn't say that, he wouldn't have paid me more money either. Yeah, yeah. I really like it as a concept. Uh, it's something I'm giving very serious, serious thought to. The, the only downside on my part is I'm very bad at keeping track of my progression within a company. Like I've probably got all my contracts that I've started on at each organization over the years, but my history of what's happened within that company, how many times I've been promoted internally, I've probably got less record of because it's been nigh on 20 years now. Um, but mm -hmm. um, 
I'm always certainly, um, without pivoting, pivoting straight onto the recruitment discussion, um, I'm always very, very open with salary discussions when I'm um, putting myself forward for a role. I'm, I'm always the first to talk about it just to get it out in the open and stop everyone from wasting each other's time if necessary. Um, like the, mm. the move that I've just done a few months ago, um, I, as I was telling people, I was technically prepared to take a pay cut for that one because um, I, my reason for moving was I want to remain a full-time remote worker if I stayed where I was, I was going to incur something like five, six, seven thousand pounds a year commuting costs. So I'm like, actually, mm. I would be prepared to drop this low for this role. Uh, and for one company, which is Postman, they're like, don't care. We're going to pay you this much, which is in the other direction, which is great. And they, this other company I was talking to said, well, we're, um, we're we're glad to hear you're prepared to drop down. We, we could probably just about meet you at that point. But, you know, it was, it was very clear that I was pushing uh, boundaries that were already existing and it was going to be difficult to get up even you know where i to join them i was probably already at the ceiling of what i was going to get which was unfortunate but um i just think much better that than go through two or three interviews with a company to find out you're the best possible candidate and then they go well we, we can't get close to, to what you're actually looking for yeah that would suck <laughs> yeah and that's that's a very important upfront conversation to have particularly if you've got a few years under your belt right you're going to have a very high yeah. expectation and, and, you know, over the last year or two, salaries have been coming up, you know, a, a, a good little chunk. I wonder if people who've had jobs since before then have had, you know, proportional raises, you know, to match whatever they're paying for, like, you know, new people coming in, you know, probably not, right? Mm hmm. Probably not. What was really nice when, um, so when I negotiated my current wage was, um, so I'd been working in London, so I was on like London wages and I moved back to Leeds and the wages are different. And, um, I, you know, I was speaking to my CTO and I'm like, well, I was getting paid this much, so I'd like this much. And he's like, I can't do that because then you'd be getting paid more than the other people at your, where you are. And I was like, well, I don't want that. Like <laughs> that shit, mm -hmm. I, like, you know, what, what level are they at like what should I come in at and he was like this much and I was like okay cool I'll be at that amount because it's not fair otherwise is mm, it um mm. and it it wasn't a shit wage it was just like I was I was getting London wages before mm. um so yeah I think kind of that kind of honesty as well um is quite good yeah. I think it's really useful to have rich attributable data that, that, that of the type that Jamie is providing because there are other services out there. LinkedIn, for example, will give you these huge bands and say, I don't know, for a test engineer, you should expect to be paid between mm. 30 and 80,000. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, that's not useful at all. And you'll have <laughs> sites like Gla Glass, Glassdoor, people, people either make figures up or you know, they're, they're not entirely verifiable. Um, but you can actually, if you can point yeah. to them and say, no, here is someone who's working in the same industry as me. They've been through a similar career path and this is, this is where they're at. How do I get there? Um, I think that's something mm. that, that could um, be really for just help raise the bar for salaries across the industry. I think this is a, a, a move that has to be applauded. It obviously, it takes some guts to do it. Um, there are potential downsides, mm. I'm, I'm sure, um, you know, w whether it, it stymies future salary negotiations because they, because everything's out there and people can, can choose to pay you based on what, what you've already put out there i don't know but um it's it's a yeah. talking point and it's um it's re really brave and, and interesting maybe that's a good segue to move on to uh, actually uh what jamie said um so he did he, i actually uh, pinged him because he followed us on, on twitter and he so i actually pinged him i sent him a message saying uh mm -hmm. you know asking him um you know uh what's happened post sort of this article and you know he, he was nice enough to reply he seems like a really cool guy um and uh he said he'll be tuning in and he's really looking forward to hearing uh what we discuss around this issue and um uh, uh I'll paraphrase some of some of what he said. Uh, he said, you know, he's been praised by a lot of people for his move, which is, which is great. And uh, he, he feels like he's also helped a few people get some promotions. So, uh, or sorry, get some raises, uh, which is good. I mean, that's the intended uh, outcome, right? Um, on on LinkedIn as well, we had uh, Hazik uh, say, very cool idea. I'd like to see more of this across the industry. Pers personally, I, happy talk, ha I happily talk to colleagues and peers about salary, but I know some people still find it taboo. The more people that talk about it in the open, the more likely we are to have a level playing field and stop good developers from being underpaid and undervalued. Sadly, a lot of the major companies really do take advantage, especially with more junior members of the team. Totally, 100% agree with that. You know, they a lot of a lot of places take the piss with juniors. 
So I think a lot of the time with juniors as well is the people deciding the wages for the juniors. How long ago was it that they were a junior? Mm, mm. And so when they're like, I don't know, like 20 grand is a good wage because I was on 12 grand or whatever. Yeah, and it's yeah. just like, you're, you're 50, mate. <laughs> like, <laughs> can we look at the market instead? Because that is not an acceptable wage anymore for graduates, no. you know, um, and so, yeah, you need to you need to keep in mind what's going on in the market. And I feel that things going remote is going to shake this up so much as well. Like, mm. because I won't have the thing of like London and Leeds salary so much anymore either. Like, mm. yeah. Yeah, I've seen companies that I feel like I should be calling out on LinkedIn, like where I know people who work there and they're advertising, like we want full stack test engineers with, you know, docker experience and you know azure background background in azure and we'll pay you 20 to 35k i'm like that's not what you mm. get for that money <laughs> yeah no but surely the ecosystem balances itself out because they will either not get any many people or get uh, underqualified people and then realize they need to change you would hope this this Maybe. gives me uh, this gives me a massive flashback to my worst ever recruitment experience um that i don't think i've spoken about in public before i don't think basically i, I interviewed somewhere um it was a, a company local to me who were advertising a salary much higher than anything else in the area it wasn't a very big tech area so i was like wow that's really interesting i, I must go and have a talk to them about that they clearly want someone with a, a, a huge background in test the advert was very vague and i had a really very productive very mature discussion with them in the interview where it was, it was clear they didn't really know what they wanted but they were like you know if you were to come in what other sort of things you would do and i would like lay out i laid out a plan of how i would get them up to an area of quality that they should be at Never heard back from them again, but then they delisted the job ad and relisted it with everything that I said in the interview as what their requirements were and with the oh salary about 30, 40% down. Like, here's how much you want to pay Jeez. and here's what you're going to do. So they were never going to hire me. They basically wow. got me in to spec out their job wow. ad. Wow. What a bunch of pricks. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah, mm. I imagine they're now bankrupt. Wow. I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't checked. They were, they were a small uh, Peterborough-based travel firm, very, very small. Uh, but, yeah, that was not mm. a good time. Wow. I, I've never heard of anything like that. I just wanted to call out um, something as well. So uh, in 2019, I went to lead Dev in Berlin, and Kevin Goldsmith did a really fantastic talk about how does salary work. And one of the things that he said there um, that has stuck with me ever since is if you interview someone and they're asking for a salary that is too low, it is your job to educate them and tell them like that salary is too low. Um, mm. You need to ask for more whether you hire them or not. I believe that's what he said, but he said like definitely if you hire them, you like don't say like I got a good deal like sort it out because a lot of the time it will be women or underrepresented groups or anything mm. like that. And yeah, it's now part of your job to like stop that kind of thing happening. So yeah, really, really good talk. We'll link it in the show notes if you wanted to check it out. And I think, yeah, cool. the, the onus is on, as, as Jamie is doing, I think the onus is on all of us to share and help each other. I've certainly been back when we used to be able to mingle at conferences, which seems like a long time ago now. I've certainly been in groups of, of people where we've all basically said, hands in the air, let's all disclose what the first digit of our salary is. And let's compare that. And it's interesting to see where the bigger numbers are <laughs> and how far off the bigger numbers you are and who has the bigger numbers. And like, oh, OK, that's interesting mm. that, you know, is there a gender disparity there? Um, and that certainly has allowed mm. me to have more mature conversations because I'm like, no, I, I know that there are people who are at a similar level to me who have one or two digits higher than me. And um, how am I going to fix that? Gives you, it gives you something to aim for, right? Somewhere to go, right? Knowing that there's that room to grow there, you should, you should push, you should push for it, right? You should have the confidence to do it and you should have, you know, the backing and support of the people around you, right? News Bytes. I'll get started. In browser news, if, as recommended, you're running the latest version of Google Chrome, then you'll be on Chrome 94 now, which comes with an interesting and contentious update to its developer APIs. The idle detection API uses signals such as a lack of keyboard or mouse movement or noticing when you switch to another tab 
to emit an event indicating that the user is now idle. This change has been met with resistance by senior figures at Apple and Mozilla with concerns about its many potential uses for evil, ranging from monitoring employee behavior to malicious apps harnessing idle time to perform Bitcoin mining. What's worse, the setting is enabled by default, with users receiving no indication that their activity is now being monitored in such a way. Mm. If you want to disable the setting, here's where you find it. You need to go into Chrome settings, go into the section called site settings. From there, expand the additional permissions section, click on your device use, and in there, change the default from allow to don't allow. I cannot believe the stuff they get away with not telling us is going on. I'm just Thanks doing for that highlighting now. that. Yeah, I'm literally doing it as you're saying it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wasn't aware of that. Um, and that's that's really messed up. Like, yeah. what are they going to do with it? It's a little sneak. Well, I mean, it's I can see it as a useful API. You know, I, I'm a really, you know, browser front endy web kind of person. I, I can see that being useful, but I think, you know, it should at least be disabled by default, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's targeted yeah, the, at, at things like chat apps and the sort of thing where it's useful to know whether someone's around or not, but it's not, you know, it's not boxed off and it is on by default and they didn't tell anybody. Mm. Yeah. Mm, that's not good. Very sneaky. Deathloop has been out, uh, I think it's a couple of weeks now. Um, and if you're not a gamer, it's a new game that's been put out by French Arcane Studios and there's something missing in it. So... Courtney Craven, which is Cyclopedia Brain on Twitter, created a thread highlighting accessibility for the game. Um, and there is a whole host of problems that they have raised from text size, difficult to read text, no snap on menus, and there's no remapping of controls either. So there's a media outlet called Can I Play That, which is a media outlet for disabled gamers. They didn't receive a copy to review be beforehand, which raised some red flags within the community. Like, I didn't see anything about accessibility for this game beforehand. And also YouTube reviewer Steve Saylor spoke about how deep-rooted the lack of accessibility actually is within Deathloop. And it's actually part of the game play design. The game has harsh penalties for failure. There's a three-life limit before having to reset the current loop which means that like you make no progress if you fail, which if you have difficulty controlling the game, it just adds a massive barrier to progress, which a lot of other games doesn't have. So Steve Saylor doesn't believe the game will be accessible in the future either due to it being so intertwined into the gameplay design. He specifically says I and many other disabled players won't be able to play this game. So. What I find really interesting about this is I didn't know that the game wasn't going to be accessible before I bought it. And I need to use accessibility settings in the game um, because I'm a terrible gamer. And um, <laughs> they're saying that, you know, you get better at playing this game and all this kind of thing. But they've totally locked out a lot of people that would have been able to play the game. I had a look at the accessibility settings as soon as I started because I... Like whenever I start a new game, it's something that I look through so I can be like, okay, cool. Is there anything that can help me um, so I can actually mm -hmm. play this game? And it's really light on the touch. And the fact that they just didn't send it to, can I play that? Um, yeah. They knew it was inaccessible, but it wasn't really highlighted. Um, yeah, it's just a shame, I think, that it's yeah. kind of been hidden. Well, yeah, you know, a lot of people depend on accessibility. And, you know, um, it, uh, I don't know if it's... a I don't know how excusable it is that, you know, they, they don't make it accessible for people. You know, I, I know there was a little bit of buzz and hype around this game. You know, um, I, I had a look at it and it's probably not my kind of genre. I think it looked really interesting and yeah, it's a shame that they kind of missed that trick. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's like definitely not very playable if, um, like if you use accessibility settings, um, mm. yeah, very big shame and hidden. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a challenge throughout all of tech is getting accessibility put front and center when, you know, certain people, product managers or whoever may say, mm. well, it's, you know, how big a percentage of users will this, will this impact? Uh, and the answer is you should do it because it's the right thing yeah. to do. Uh, and there are games out there, game series in particular, that do mm. this really well. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of all, there are many, many options in the Borderlands series, a uh, series that I'm really into, who have, um, they've been very careful to make sure that where there are things that are like, 
color dependent. There are other ways that you can tell um, other than color. So for example, when a weapon drops, um, there's a, like a glow around the weapon to show how good a weapon it is, but also they all make a different sound, like a slightly different tone of noise on the weapon. So you could say actually, oh, I can hear that's a good weapon, even if I can't tell the, the color apart, that sort of thing. So uh, The Last of Us was like ridiculous with it. The Last of Us is, uh, I think they won awards for their accessibility, but also Animal Crossing was mm. very good for accessibility as well. Um, so when you walked near, I can't remember what you used to dig up at the beach, but when you walked near it, you could yeah. hear that shells. you were walking. Shells, was it shells? Yeah, um, and stuff like that. And you can watch people, um, like blind people play it. Um, and mm. yeah, it's it's great. And it just adds so much as well. Like, And these mm. things that you don't realize, like, oh, the reason why it shakes is actually an accessibility thing, but it, yeah. 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 Yeah, the, the amount of things that I'm having to discover that I have to try and do now with one hand because I've got a child under one arm. I mean, it's not necessarily tech, but, you know, <laughs> the, the things you take for granted, you're like, no, actually, I can't do this thing with one arm. And, you know, but some of us yeah. only have one arm <laughs> at, at best or, or other limited mobility. Yeah. When, when I bought Deathloop and I started playing it and the sad realisation, this game isn't for me. Like, mm. I can't really play this game. It's just not for me. And I can't imagine the feeling that you would have when, you know, you get a game like this and because of accessibility reasons, like how many games are not for you and how yeah. many things are not for you. And that yeah. feeling yep. would just be awful. So yeah, um, it's, it's just really sad and accessibility is important. Hopefully, you know, like we see more games with it in the future, like, yeah, Naughty Dog who did Last of Us, always like put it quite front and center and i think it's really important there's a, a really really awesome. heartwarming and emotional story that i will i'll link to a youtube video of in, in the show notes um from the creators of elite dangerous um they had a, a fan of the game who was a young child who w was uh had a terminal uh, condition that, that over time was gradually reducing his ability to play the game and the team heard about this and they wanted to keep him enjoying the experience of being in the game world. And basically at very, very short notice, they got a whole load of talent together for free to produce like an audio book with this child's name in it, like a, a custom like podcasty style, like they've dropped his name into wow. it. It's like an adventure that he could listen to, you know, even though he could no longer play the game, they dropped the name of his ship into the story and they allowed him to experience, you know, him having heroic adventures, even though he literally couldn't play the That's game great. anymore. And uh, I was bawling at that. <laughs> It's brilliant. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, drop that. That's cool. I, I love Elite Dangerous. I used to play that in VR. And oh my God, it's yeah. so much fun. Competition time. So oh, here we are at the business end of the episode again with the clock ticking around to close to an hour again. <laughs> we'll, we'll get tighter, I promise, but I hope you're you <laughs> having as good a time as we are. Um, just a quick shout out to uh, the winner of last week's contest. We had a £20 Amazon voucher to give away, courtesy of the kind folks at Cook My Grub. And the winner of that was a friend of the show, Beth Marshall, uh, for uh, sharing and retweeting. Our hey. episode. Thank you very much, Beth. Your £20 Amazon voucher is winging its way to you now. Uh, if you are also someone who is interested in either promoting your business or giving us swag or similar to give away, we're always on the lookout for sponsors. So drop us a line either individually or through our Tech Team Weekly account and uh, we'll see what we can hook you up with. The Wash Up. Shall we move on to the end? Yeah, sure. I think okay, we'll have to, otherwise brilliant. we won't get anything so, done today. That... <laughs> <laughs> So this is the conclusion of this week's episode. Uh, we had a lot of uh, things to say this week, so it might be a bit longer. I don't know. Maybe we can cut it down. Yeah, we really appreciate all your feedback. So uh, give us a shout on Twitter. You can DM us or you can say it in public as well um, or on LinkedIn. Um, get replying to our tweets during the week so we can include your responses in the episode. And yeah, thanks again for listening. We really appreciate it. And please consider subscribing. All right. Good evening. All right. See you next week. See you all soon. Bye. Bye. Good day. Good day. <laughs> Tech Team Weekly.